Political turmoil in the UK. Both main parties are suffering a crisis of leadership and failing to say what happens next after Brexit. So what's causing this lack of vision? And how is it complicating Britain's divorce from the EU? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, the Brexit vote is causing the worst crisis the UK has seen for years and it's leaving Britons without political leadership when they need it most. David Cameron became a caretaker Prime Minister following the announcement of his resignation last week. He insists the UK needs fresh leadership in its leave negotiations with the EU. His ruling Conservative Party has begun searching for a new leader and Boris Johnson, the pro-leave former Mayor of London, is favourite to win so far. Meanwhile, the opposition Labour Party is also in disarray. 80% of Labour MPs backed a vote of no confidence in their leader, Jeremy Corbyn. He's refusing to resign, saying he has the backing of the Labour Party across the country. Both parties are choosing new leaders as speculation grows about an early election. All right, let's introduce our guests now. All of them are in London. Patrick Diamond, who's chair of the Policy Network think tank. Tony Travers, director of the research centre LSE London. That's at the London School of Economics. And Sam Chris, who's a freelance writer and journalist. Welcome to you all. Tony, can I start with you? Uh, the Economist has said that when the phone rings, nobody is picking up. Why is Britain in this state of political void? Well, this, all, this is all fallout, or mostly fallout, from the uh, surprise, certainly to put surprising to the political establishment, the surprise referendum result last week when Britain voted to leave the European Union. That triggered David Cameron uh, the next morning to announce that he was standing down, but as you say, he's going to carry on as a caretaker Prime Minister. So there is somebody there, there is still a Prime Minister. But separately from all of this, there had long been disquiet within the opposition Labour Party, the main opposition Labour Party, about the leader they chose last September, Jeremy Corbyn, and the result of the referendum has triggered the Labour Party, many of the members of Parliament who didn't want Corbyn in the first place, effectively to start the process of trying to get rid of him. So all of this is playing out in real time now, in parallel, with, of course, nobody able to take any next step action in the question of what Britain does next in relation to starting the process of leading, leaving the EU. And uh, Patrick, I mean, people outside of Britain can't believe it. They can't believe that the political elite, A, were taken completely by surprise, given that they had uh, fairly consistent poll results uh, to mull over in the run-up to the actual referendum, and B, that uh, strategic planning wasn't put in place anyway. Yeah, I mean, there has been strategic planning in the sense that it's clear that the, the Treasury and the financial regulatory authorities, together with the Bank of England, have put in place uh, contingency plans, not least to try to manage the volatility in the market. So I think at the official technocratic level, there has been a reasonable amount of strategic planning. But of course, politically, you're quite right. It's a very volatile situation. As Tony just said, the decision of the British people to vote to leave the European Union, all by albeit by a small, relatively small uh, number of votes in terms of percent, the percentage of the vote, has taken the political establishment by surprise. People did not believe what the polls were saying, even when they started to move much more in favour of uh, an exit vote. No one quite believed it was going to happen. There was uh, a kind of hope that people would revert to the status quo the closer to polling day, but of course it didn't happen. And there are a lot of people in the political establishment who are shocked. Some people read this as a sign of the disconnection of the Westminster elite from the rest of the country, that many politicians just simply didn't know what was going on, even in their own constituencies. And uh, Sam, this uh, volatility comes at a time of extraordinary significance, where many important decisions need to be taken. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I think it speaks, uh, especially within the Labour Party, to a, a really profound lack of judgment uh, among uh, the 
Labour Party MPs who are choosing this particular moment uh, when the party and the nation, and to an extent Europe, uh, needs leadership to, uni uh, to be united uh, and leads a, needs a strong left voice in the coming negotiations. Uh, and at a time when you have some very dangerous far-right ideologies on the rise in Britain, uh, that they would choose this moment to further destabilise their own party. So you think um, this is so you think this is um, a, a case of of bad judgment on the part of the parliamentary Labour Party. I think it's a case of terrible judgment um, because not, not only are they doing this at the worst possible moment, they don't seem to have any real plan for their move against their leadership to actually succeed. They haven't yet put forward any viable candidate who could stand against Corbyn in a leadership election. Uh, they don't have any mechanism for uh, getting him to resign apart from resigning en masse and if he doesn't resign after that then essentially they've played all their cards. Uh, I think they've kind of recklessly destabilised um, the Labour Party to no end and for no very good reason. OK, um, Patrick, uh, Boris Johnson in particular seems to have been genuinely taken by surprise by the resignation of David Cameron. How much of a spanner in the works is that, the fact that uh, the uh, incumbent has uh, wiped his hands basically washed his hands pretty much of the of the next stage of the process and said it's up to you guys you sort it out uh, and effectively just a caretaker role well it is creating a lot of political uncertainty and as uh, some people have remarked it was amazing on Friday morning that the decision of the British Prime Minister to resign his post was I think reported as the third or fourth item on the morning news because so much turmoil was going on elsewhere in the financial markets it was almost uh, an afterthought that David Cameron had actually uh, decided that in the light of the referendum result he had no choice but to uh, stand down. It does undoubtedly leave the Conservatives with major problems um, because they now have to decide who is the right leader to take them forward. There are presumably going to be major splits within the Conservative Party. It's not clear at the moment how they can um, devise a strategy that can unite the party, given that there is this cleavage between those Conservative MPs who want to maintain access to the single market and maintain close ties to Europe, which of course is a policy supported very strongly by the business and finance community to which the Conservatives have traditionally been very close, as against those Conservative MPs who are much closer to the Leave camp, who want there to be uh, a much more explicit break in Britain's relationship with Europe. And that tension is going to be played out in the Conservative leadership election. But once that's resolved, it's going to be played out in the next few years in terms of the position, the direction that the Conservative government tries to develop. The Conservatives have been badly divided on Europe for 20, probably going on 30 years. And despite having this referendum, which was supposed to be a moment of clarification, there is no evidence to me anyway that these divisions are going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, that's a point, isn't it, uh, Tony? The fact is that we've got a summer, uh, possibly even going in, into the autumn, of uh, turmoil, of uncertainty on the political front. Can you remember a time ever before when we've had both main parties in Britain uh, so polarised, so divided? There's certainly nothing like this since 1945. And I think what's intriguing about it is that it uh, makes many people inside the political establishment so that they can feel the impact on them personally. Often in politics, people, uh, you know, they're aware they've won or lost and they feel something for a bit and then it all goes away. But this is sort of viscerally taken inside them and they, so they feel it as well. And it's leading to fascinating divisions and arguments within uh, society in Britain. But I think the thing about the Conservatives here is that they've set a process which they've speeded up somewhat so they'll have a new leader by uh, the 2nd of September. But as Patrick Diamond said, I mean, the, the, the intriguing thing about this is that person who becomes the new Prime Minister and has to try to heal both his own party and broadly British politics, this person then has to choose whether to start the process, the so-called Article 50 process, which David Cameron said he won't trigger, so the next Prime Minister will have to decide when to do that and how to do it. And that's an enormous weight on them from day one, because undoubtedly there'll be further turmoil at the point that that takes place. And Sam, it sounds very much as though uh, the Labour Party is not really going to have too much of a, uh, a constructive 
uh, contribution to the debate that uh, is going to be gripping the country uh, for the next few months, largely because of its own internal battles that are already underway? Well, the, the Labour Party has been uh, fighting itself for the last six months and uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like that's going to change in the um, near term, why, why which is has, Sam, why has the Labour Party been in such uh, a divided state? It was, what, six, nine months ago that uh, Jeremy Corbyn was elected with a vast majority to lead the party, but he was never terribly popular, was he, with his parliamentary members? No, I mean, I feel like essentially you have a political class within Labour uh, who have uh, convinced themselves of a very narrow dogma about what it means to be electable and what it means to get elected, which is essentially the kind of Blairite pact that was formed in the 1990s. Um, and because many of, not all of these people now actually, but because many of them remember Labour's long wilderness years in the 1980s, um, they're very certain this is the only possible way that they can ever get into power again, uh, essentially by aping Blair's strategy. Uh, as I think Corbyn's shown, this simply isn't true. Um, you have the, uh, the Labour plotters at the moment who are attempting to build a new leadership that would return to the kind of style of opposition and the kind of uh, message which lost Labour elections in 2015 and in 2010. Um, but I think the reason that a lot of people in Parliament are not willing to uh, get rid of this orthodoxy is because it's one that gives them power. Uh, and I feel a, a lot of uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party are actually very distrustful and very scared of their own membership. Uh, you had a few days ago a very large demonstration in Parliament Square in support of the uh, leader of the party. Uh, and members of the party were, I think, obscenely comparing it to uh, the kind of stoking up of tensions that, uh, that came before the murder of, of Joe Cox, which uh, I, I think is a really abhorrent comparison when you're comparing uh, this climate of hatred and tension that was seizing the country in the run-up to the referendum with people who are trying to defend uh, equality and defend especially the rights of migrants. And Tony, add to this uh, rather toxic mix, it must be said, the increasing possibility or at least the speculation about the possibility of an early election being called. Yes, I don't think personally there's likely to be an election in the immediate future. I mean, just, just to pause back on the Labour Party, I think it's worth explaining that it is true that the Labour uh, MPs um, are very uncomfortable with the leader. The leader was elected by the members, but the members themselves are a very small subsection, very small in both major parties, of the wider electorate. And I think what the MPs fear is that unless the party is broadly uh, appealing to a wide electorate, then it's going to be difficult to win a coming general election. I think that's the difference between the party membership, who are very fond of the leader, Jeremy Corbyn, and the MPs, who are trying to think about how to get a leader who they think can win a general election. Now, I don't think there'll be a general election immediately. It doesn't suit the Labour Party. Uh, the Conservatives probably don't want to do it. They only won one last year. And I think it's just worth adding, though, before we get completely taken away with doom and gloom. I mean, outside there today in Britain, all the rest of society is functioning as normal. Businesses are working, people at work, local government functions, civil society, charities and so on. Everything else is working out there perfectly normally. This is going on at the top of the I, political I system with, with the and it will have normal. to sort it out. OK, sorry, Sam, you wanted to oh, say normal... something. Sorry, yeah, Sa okay. Sam, Sam wanted uh, I... to interject there. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's perfectly normal. Um, something has changed. The only thing you can deny that something has changed. Um, you know, uh, we, we are in a very deep crisis. Obviously, some uh, economic life is still going on. Obviously, personal life is still going on. A lot of people I know have been uh, very shocked and very altered by what happened since the referendum. But at the same time, there's been a dramatic increase in, um, in violent hate crime, in uh, racism on the streets. We've had uh, attempted firebombing. Uh, of hallow butchers, um, that there's, there's definitely a change of mood and attitude in this country um, that, that is taking place. Um, and and, uh, no, and just... to simply say that life as normal is going on, well, obviously on some level is correct, but it doesn't really re uh, re represent the shock of what's happening. 
OK, so, Patrick, what needs... No, I to... don't disagree. I don't disagree. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry. no, Tony, oh. please, you continue. No, I was just going to... I was only going to come back and say, I, I take the point that there are, there are some downside consequences. I'm not, I don't want to minimise that. I'm just trying to get away from the idea that, you know, for most of Britain, most of the time, what goes on in the top of politics in London doesn't seep into every day, into every part of the country. And I'm just trying to give... Not to give the impression that uh, the rest of... Aiming off, there are some bad things, as has been described, but generally, Britain is still a governable place with powerful All right. institutions okay, fair which point. are capable of state taking this. Uh, but, Patrick, coming to you now, what now needs to happen? Because we do have uh, a Prime Minister only in a caretaker capacity, uh, the implication being that he will steady the ship and, and no more. What needs to happen? Because the Conservative Party have got to come up with a, an alternative candidate and they've got to do it soon. Yeah, I mean, just going back to the previous um, discussion, I think on one level it's clearly true that um, as far as you know, business and the day-to-day -day work of the economy is concerned, you know, things are carrying on. I mean, we're seeing a lot of turmoil in the markets, but the markets are to some degree detached from what's happening in the real economy. And actually, I think one of the problems in the referendum campaign was the attempt by both sides of the argument to, you know, in a sense, try to scare people for different reasons into voting a certain way. And of course, that didn't really work, particularly for the Remain side, because many people felt detached from the kind of economy that the Remain side was talking about. If you're suffering very low living standards, if your wages have been in decline for a long time, if the industries in the place where you live have been in decline for many decades, then the argument that somehow you've got something at stake, there is something risky here, um, is actually much more difficult to land. So, you know, I think, I think that the, the dynamics of that ha have been very important in driving at least some voters towards a, a leave position. I think on the question of institutions, it's true that, of course, Britain, certainly in, in relative terms, has effective institutions. But I think there are some tensions, again, which have arisen as a consequence of the referendum and its aftermath, one of which is you know, the tension between direct and representative democracy, which is being played out in terms of some of the things that Sam is saying about the turmoil in the Labour Party. There's a conflict between MPs who are elected in Parliament and members and the wider electorate. Um, and then, of course, in the referendum, there's a conflict because the people have voted one way, but in fact, the vast majority of members of Parliament broadly support a Remain position. And, you know, the British Constitution is based on, obviously, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, the Crown in Parliament. It's not easy to see how that's always reconciled with the kind of direct democracy that we've seen in the referendum All campaign. Right, well, so well, can we get I wouldn't back, be so get complacent to, about Britain's position. Can we get back to the process, what needs to happen now in order to, to uh, get in place some leadership of what appears to be a rudderless ship? So what do the Conservatives need to do? What kind of person needs to get into number 10? Well, I'm certainly not best placed to advise the Conservative Party on uh, who they should um, select as their next leader. The indications seem to be at the moment that there is some dynamic shifting in favour of Theresa May. Perhaps that's not surprising because Boris Johnson, I think, has attracted clearly a lot of hostility around his role in the Leave campaign. He's seen more as a divisive figure. And it might be that having obviously achieved on Thursday a great victory as far as he's concerned, he may have actually taken away from himself, I think, what was always his ultimate prize, which was um, the Tory party leadership. And it may be that the Conservatives, we don't know, but it may be that the, the, the consensus in the party shifts in favour of having a leader like Theresa May, who is seen perhaps as a more consensual problem solver, a less divisive figure than Boris Johnson, who can get on with trying to deal with some of the very big governing challenges that any uh, government will face, not least in trying to negotiate a smooth pathway forward in respect of Britain's European policy. And Tony, the invocation of this uh, controversial yeah. but now very well known Article 50 will be perhaps the, the main task of whoever gets in. But I'm just wondering about mandates and whether uh, whoever is, replaces David Cameron needs to go uh, to the public again in a general election in order to put forward uh, a new manifesto. Well, it's possible that after 
the new leader is selected. And that is the big, the next step. A new Conservative leader who will become Prime Minister early in September then decides how to move forward. Just to comment on what uh, the discussion about who it might be, there is an argument playing out in London now about whether, uh, and I absolutely agree on the Boris Johnson, Theresa May uh, choice, there, there are others coming forward now, and uh, there is an argument saying it needs to be the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister needs to be somebody who was in favour of leaving because they'd have greater leeway to negotiate. Now, I'm not saying that will mean Boris Johnson will win, but it's an argument that's being uh, put forward. But the truth is, it's not going to be sorted out until early September, quite a long time given the instability and turbulence in the financial and other markets. And even in early September, uh, it may be that the new government takes some time to think about when exactly it's going to step and what it's going to do, because they'll have to have a new government in effect. But I think a general election immediately, probably not, though it is possible one could take place in a year or two if and when it was clear what the new terms for Britain's relationship with the EU were and those needed to be tested. So, Sam, clearly uh, the Labour Party has got to limber up and get itself sorted out pretty soon, hasn't it? Uh, in, terms um, of, in terms of replacements uh, for Jeremy Corbyn, or will it even come to that? Because he's so far remaining firm and saying that he has the democratic mandate of his party. Well, I mean, uh, immediately I'd have to agree. I, I don't think there's any nece necessarily any um, impetus for there to be a general election immediately. Um, you know, the thing about Britain is that we have a parliamentary system, but uh, some sectors of the population seem to act as if we ought to have a presidential system, uh, such as when uh, Gordon Brown assumed power, it was kind of assumed that there would be a general election, even though there was no constitutional need for one. And I think we're going to face something very similar. The uh, next, conserv uh, next Conservative Prime Minister, uh, whoever they are, uh, would I think be very loath to call a general election because um, especially if they, um, well, um, uh, especially if it's Boris Johnson or another person supporting the Leave campaign, it could be taken as a second referendum, which uh, having achieved the result they want is absolutely not what they want. Um, with regards to the Labour Party, um, I think the party does actually have some time in which to work through its problems. Um, in terms of potential uh, candidates to challenge Jeremy Corbyn, um, a few have been suggested. Uh, no one's actually fully stepped forward yet, to my knowledge. Uh, the last I heard was that uh, Tom Watson and Angela Eagle are now quite uh, entirely at loggerheads trying to work out which of them would be the best person to run against Corbyn and to be honest I think the answer is neither of them. The Labour right has not really been able to put forward uh, a single credible or satisfying candidate who would have uh, a chance uh, at convincing the membership of the party that they would do a better job and represent the interests of the party better than Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, Tony can I give the final word to you because um, I just wondered what your assessment uh, of the current situation is and would it be fair to say that uh, the issue of Europe has cleaved Britain uh, into, if not into more pieces, but cleaved Britain into in a way that nobody could have anticipated? I think that's exactly right. I think they don't think anybody could or indeed dared think through to the point. Of course, people rationally could see Britain might vote to leave the EU, but they never, they didn't have any idea quite what it would feel like if we did, which is where we've got to now. And the question from here on is how the people at the top of British political life not, not only deal with the issue that the referendum itself threw up, which is whether Britain should stay on in the EU or not, which has been answered def absolutely definitively, Britain's going to leave the EU, but there are a whole load of other issues thrown up by this, some of which we've already mentioned in discussion, about how some people, particularly outside London and the South, feel very much left behind by the modern economy, about failures of the British political parties any longer to appeal to members or any large number of people. All of those issues, the centralisation of Britain, those will also have to be addressed too, because if we leave the EU and things don't get better for the people who voted against the EU, they'll then look for something or somebody else to blame. OK, thank you very much indeed. Tony Travers, Patrick Diamond and Sam Chris, thank you all.
And as ever, thank you for watching this programme. You can see it any time you like, of course, by going to the website aljazeera.com. If you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, Facebook facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. There's always a Twitter sphere as well, our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Martin Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha. It's bye for now.